Where do collectors go on vacation? I'm George the Antique Nomad and watch this video and you'll find out. We have a lot of fun going through a historic home and I get to actually appraise some of this museum's treasures, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique mall shops and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Well, you probably hear the bagpiper behind me. We are at Henderson Hall outside of Marietta, Ohio. We're here to see Dave Fetty blow glass. And this is a really neat place where you can see all sorts of old things happening. Here is this wonderful old home. That staircase doesn't go anywhere anymore. Mills on the, on the property where they sold all the lumber. The lumber that went into this house was sent away to Marietta, to craftsmen of Marietta that did uh, the milling and, and all, the, all the work on that. They had their own brick kilns, they had their own brick makers. They made the bricks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So most of the material in the building of this house was, actually came from their property. Wow. Um, and everything you see belonged to the family. Yeah, it looks like a lot of the furnishings are original to the house. Oh, they are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything is. But oh, that's great. Nothing's been brought in because there was five generations that lived here. Wow. And, and nobody these, else has ever lived here. And these three lights on this floor pulled down from the ceiling. Oh, yes. Oh. And interestingly enough, these lights in the beginning were the way they are now. They converted these lights to gas mm -hmm. around 1875. Okay when gas became available. That's when they quit using coal and uh, wood uh -huh. in the fireplaces. But now around 1902, when electricity became available, they took out the gas lights and put in the electric. Okay? When Michael Ralston, the last living Henderson, Henderson descendant, came back, Michael wanted it restored back to its original, and he restored it back to the original lights. Now how these things were converted from what they are today, uh -huh. to gas, to electric, to the original is amazing. George Washington was best friends with the patriarch of the family. Oh! You know, oh their farms adjoined each other. <clears throat> if you read uh, George Washington journals, you'll see um, many, many mentions of his dear friend, Mr. Henderson. You're he kidding me! Esquire Henderson. That's so interesting. Uh, The Lafayette Kerchief. Lafayette came to Marietta in 1825 on his tour of the United States and in honor of the 50th anniversary of the American Revolution, which he held greatly in. And the Lafayette Hotel in Marietta is actually named after him. If you're not too dizzy, um. <laughs> somebody might have tried going down these once, but that's probably all. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> Oh yeah, whole hand painted floor. That is neat. Now we're going up the narrow stairs to the upper, upper stories. You can see the cleats where they used to have the carpet attached. Here we are in the belfry. Wow. Back in the day when these trees were not here, you could actually see clear to the river. You can barely see the river today where those tanks are over there. These are the actual boxes. These are all candy boxes. Aren't they beautiful? Mm -hmm. I mean, the candy boxes themselves are like art. The red one is the one I told you had uh, cigarettes in it. Mm -hmm. This one right here, it has the, the wrap or the rolled cigarettes, and she had hidden them in that box on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd send these to herself so yes. that she looked popular. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Our modern day back then was send yourself a candy box. That's right. <laughs> That's right. She had a cousin that was um, Mall Kettle on, on TV. The picture of Marlena Dietrich there, she had, guard, she had um, guarded their family during that time. And she worked with them, that's the reason I picture there. Primarily, she just wanted a life different from here. Yeah. But she ended up inheriting the house and living here until she died. The arrowheads, all these things. The stone tools and yes. Yes, and you can tell that you know the tomahawk heads and all that. Oh stuff. yeah, and some axe heads mm -hmm. yes, and a uh, lot of grinding and pounding tools. Mm -hmm. Very neat. The Native American people, the Adena, or the mounds, 
But there's Shawnee Woods in this area as well. I think people just were used to being hot a lot back then. Oh, look at that. Now this is George Washington, the Henderson, the builder of the house. This is his wedding suit, and this is his wife's wedding dress. Oh my goodness! This is his mother's wedding dress. Now it looks like a nightgown, but it's an actual wedding dress. 1801 Empress, yes. Empress style, Anna Rosalie, the one I told you, the pictures downstairs. She came here as a school teacher, and. Um, they married. That's their wedding attire. And then the down and the next one is Elizabeth's morning clothes. This is her morning outfit. The fur clip is amazing. Yeah, they're they're pretty collectible now too. They were right. They were the same. They weren't right or left. And so as you wore them, then they became fitted to your. It feet. wore to your feet, yeah. right? You but had this, to break them in. Yeah, but that's what these two pairs are. There's no right nor left. Well, this pair here too. Well, how simple that was. Why did you change? Well, it probably <laughs> hurt. <laughs> Yeah, they probably did hurt for a while. Oh, they? yeah. From the family from different eras, it shows the progression of fashion. Yeah. Look at the black cat with yeah. a feather on it. That's gorgeous. Oh, how awesome that is. We're just playing here, but if we were appraising this for a house like this, it would be for insurance. So it would be the top value in the market. And at that, I, I did an appraisal recently for the Washington State Governor's Mansion, and they had a few period pieces that age. And you know, I think we were, I think we were somewhere in the six thousand, seven thousand dollar per chair price for insurance purposes. Okay. Oh, the the one who is the flapper who worked for Marlena Dietrich, yes. Wow, that's beautiful. I'll step back so you can see. The story says there's 23 rooms, I believe, and there's at least one fireplace in every room, and some have two. What? And they started with wood and coal, and eventually went to gas. 19 fireplaces in this house. Yes. Think about that. <laughs> Well, this is an interesting piece too, this big settle bench here, because... Yeah, this is one of my most interesting pieces of furniture in this place. Yeah. A settle bench? Yeah, well, it's Hitchcock painted, but um, I've never seen one with the baby rail before. Yeah. That's really interesting. So you could put the baby down next to you and not worry about it rolling if you fell asleep yeah, too. Exactly. <laughs> I've actually never seen that. I've been in a lot of historic homes. That's really interesting. Oh, and it's a rocker, I see. So yeah, even more appropriate for the baby. Yeah. Jock, who was uh, one of the grandsons, his daughter, Rosalie, opened her room and she's the real creative person. He was kind of a tyrant. She lived here 63 years. He did not want her to marry because he wanted to be taken care of at this point. He also didn't permit running water in this place. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1947, he died. Mm -hmm. Did she call the undertaker or the plumber first? <laughs> I would have called the plumber. We have a 1947 bathroom. <laughs> she took care of that. And yes, she did. This chair is Windsor. And it's interesting that it had a leather pad, uh, what's left of it, because um, you don't really see that very often. And that was actually more common at the time, but they're almost all worn away. So the fact that there's even a ghost of it to remind us mm -hmm. that they did that is a neat thing to see, uh, because almost nobody restores them back with the leather uh, seat at this point, because they're just used to seeing them as wood. Um, it's very short. It was probably a lady's chair at the time, uh, because if you see how very short, even I know men were short than two, but uh, when it's this small, we think child's chair, but no, the back is kind of large and the width is broader. So this would have been uh, specifically uh, considered a lady's side chair. Uh, it's got tacking here, which is interesting. That's from the original leather, what's 
what's left. And the tacking seems to be hand done as well, which is what we have to look for with these. We start looking to see if some of the pieces are machined, but this looks like this whole thing with the peg joinery and the fact that the scrolls in the arms are just slightly different from each other. So that was not done by a machine. So all of that means this is probably going to be, again, concurrent with the beginning of the residents uh, being here probably no later than 1835. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is that they made this style from about the mid 1700s all the way through to, well, I mean, they still make it today with, ma with machines. They still make Windsor style, but in terms of uh, furniture that would have been handmade, you know, probably 1830s, 40s, and then people this wealthy would have started to buy machine-made furniture because yeah. they, they could afford it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That was fun. Oh, I didn't say a value. Um, probably, I mean, it's a fairly common piece, but for insurance purposes, I would say $1,200. This looks like it's a, old enough to be a looking glass rather than the mirroring the way we think of it now. Uh, and you can see the silvering is mostly gone. Now the, these knobs are, these are glass and these are made by a machine. And here's where we start to see the difference. This looks perfectly uniform on both sides. So this looks like it was a machine era piece. Um, it's missing one of these knobs, which may have been original. And it kind of makes me think that these may have been replaced at one time because these seem newer. These seem like early 20th century. And I think the rest of the mirror is probably, if it's all right, I'm gonna gently pull out one drawer. So here's another knob. Yeah, this is what they would have looked like originally. Okay. They would have been little porcelain knobs. And there's a picture of somebody in there, maybe a family member. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Yes. And then we look for the way that it's joined. It's dovetailed, but again, the dovetail looks like machine made. So we're probably talking sometime after 1850, but before 1870 or 80, I would say. The value on these is probably, for insurance purposes, around $300, $350, I would say. It's got some nice little uh, grips on the side here too, which I won't pull out. As the family's business changed and travel was more available and more of a thing, especially when railroads come, then you start seeing more use of this kind of thing because we're going to travel, we need to take our business with us and we'll be away for a while. So I think your era on this is probably 1850 to 1870. And value on these is usually pretty good. Retail is generally in the four to six hundred dollar range and an insurance appraisal might be a thousand. So the rope bed here is interesting because first of all you've got a couple of different kinds of wood. If you notice the darkness in the posts is different from this. This is probably mahogany that would have been obtained from somewhere in uh, perhaps Honduras in that time and it seems to be solid it's not veneer uh, it's rope bed so of course and this was these were the old mattresses you strung ropes on and then you put your bedding on top if you were fortunate enough to have this kind of a bed a lot of people just slept on hay back then so i did an appraisal for a piece like this that came out of the um, virginia military institute which i noticed one of the sons ended up attending yes. and that one because of the connection to the v virginia military institute was worth about six thousand dollars I would say this one in this context again for insurance purposes for the house probably four to five thousand I would think uh, the other one got a little bit extra credit for having to do with soldiers during the Civil War because of where it was uh, but this is essentially the same era and okay. it's a really neat piece. Date? I would say pre-Civil War, probably 18, maybe as early as the beginning of occupation of the house, 18, 18, late 1830s, but they would have made the same style until about 1870 and then we start to see steel beds and that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. It's really pretty and it's going to date to about 1900, 1910 when these scenic reverse painted lamps were really popular and there are a bunch of American companies, most famously Pearpoint, that did the puffy lamp. The reverse painting, uh, I can't tell you without taking it apart who the maker is, and I don't think it matters a lot in terms of value. These typically these days, for insurance purposes, are valuing around $1,500. 
Uh, it's just a really pretty piece, though. And a beautiful it is really nice. That is so much of this is original to the house gives it extra value for being in the house. Mm -hmm. If it were taken elsewhere, it might be a different value. Nomad, the antique, George the Antique Nomad. And that's his... his and that's uh, on YouTube? Yep. Child-sized bed, that is really cute. Yeah. And we don't see those as often. Really? Yeah. So is that pretty... I think that probably is, again, right about the time of the house. And I would say that one actually is a little more valuable than the other one because you don't see child size. And I love how they even have just the little wind-up tin train from the 1880s yeah. or 90s in the, in the middle cold. of the floor. Oh, yeah, those were a big deal when they came out. And you had to be a rich little kid to have one. So That's awesome. Somebody had a good life here. When you say the old section of the house. Yes, yeah, built in 1836. Oh, so this is the very original yeah. part. And that starts with the doorway. Came through. Very so good. And the little doll without a face. Fun to see the old Victorian children's toys and early 20th century stuff. This is just very cute. You had mentioned the clock, and it's a wonderful clock. And the face shows that it was made in Marietta. And thankfully, because you're a museum, you have information I wouldn't have on this. But it says that uh, William Green was uh, constructing the cases of cherry wood here. And then the parts would have come from England, which was pretty typical of tall case clocks around 1815 when this is attributed. And it's got the great sun and moon dial. I would say uh, what really is amazing is you said this may be the only example of Green's work left, and that's probably true because clockmakers in those days, you know, they might get a couple of commissions a year. It would take them a long time to do the piece. They might only make 30 or 40 pieces in their entire career, and clocks were very expensive. Only the very wealthy could have them, so they could make enough money on that volume. It's, it's a little tricky to value because, number one, it may be the only one left of his. Number two, it's English mechanism which is usually less expensive, but it's in an American case, and there's a reason for that that we know. And number three, it's connected to the house. So um, insurance value is going to be way above what current retail would be. Insurance value, I would think you might be looking at 20000 would be a probably a pretty full estimate. There was a time that it, I might have said 25 to 30, but the fact that it's not American in movement, it's not, it it, it's not 18th century, and the clock market is not great right now. So I think that that's a more realistic value. But the thing is, could you ever really replace it? You know, at some point, if it, if it might be the only surviving example of his work, there really is no comparable because there's nothing to compare. Yeah. Okay, this is a very handsome bookcase, and it's really neat that it opens up. They really wanted to keep the dust and grime off of the books because, again, books were expensive at the time that this was made, which I would say is probably 1850s or so. The hardware appears to be 1850, 1860, this kind of a um, wooden carved turn where that shuts the door and seals it shut is typical of that time frame. And it looks to me like it's, it looks like cherry wood actually, uh, rather than mahogany. It's reminiscent of a lot of pieces that were made in this part of the country about that time. A lot of desks were made in Indiana starting around this time, and I'm sure that there were makers in Ohio too. So my guess is that it's a regional piece. Oh, you, you know who the builder that's, that's of this piece is. Oh, very good, okay. I don't know enough about furniture from this region to be able to attach that name to somebody that I know. So that would take more research, and that could be significant in the value. Not knowing that, I would say that an insurance value on this is probably around uh, eight to ten thousand. Okay. If it turns out that that person is connected, like herders desks in Indiana that were made that opened up and had lots of drawers and office fittings and things that would come out, you know, those can be twenty and twenty five thousand. So if that creator actually turned out to be worth more, then we might look at a higher value. A lot of people will find those and they don't know what they are. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and uh, they're so struck. Yeah. Yeah, I now, love the curtain tie backs. Table? Does this actually match the table, George? 
Uh, let's take a look. Okay. The cruel curtains, I just had to get a close up of those. They're so neat. Yeah, they are. I think that this, it's the same era, but I do not believe that it came with the set. So they do spinning, they do all sorts of crafts so that they can show you how things were done in the old days. And we're hoping that we haven't missed the glass blower, who is Dave Fetty, who used to work for Fenton Glass and Blanco, actually. And here we are. <laughs> this fellow had worked for Blanco initially and then worked for Fenton and then, well, he's still doing it. I think it gets under your skin and you just never want to stop. And you can watch them blowing glass as we speak. They're putting the molten glass into various cullet with various mineral solutions so that the chemicals will give the color to the glass. So there are the various minerals. You've got cobalt, which makes cobalt, and manganese makes purple, and various other chemicals make various other colors. You can see some of the things that he's done here. He's doing some things based on the old Fenton animals. There's one of his fish. These are hard to find. I actually sold two of them at the show this weekend. And if you see the boxes underneath, you see they have Blanco Handcraft logos on them because those are some of his sources of glass. Dave did a lot of modernist looking things for Fenton in the 1980s and 90s at a time when they really weren't known for that. But that's when they really started getting a lot of different artists involved and really expanding their artware lines. And because of that, Dave Fetty was a natural for them. So the two glass makers are working together in the glory hole simultaneously. He's got the gather there. He's going to roll it in more minerals so that he can impart other additional colors. This is how you get these swirls and these spatters at this end of day. And the other fellow is forming a very small piece that may be going to be a stopper if this is a bottle. Okay, now he's putting just a little air into the blowpipe. You notice they don't blow hard. It's less than even blowing up a balloon. It's just a little puff of air to get the shape going. And he's going to bring it over to the bench and work on it a little bit more. There's a lot of process in this. If that's glowing orange hot, well, that's because that's about 1,500 degrees. Let's see what he's applying here. Okay, so this is an applied piece going on the side of this piece. Trying to get it in position. This looks like it's going to be perhaps a fish or some other critter. We'll find out. So that's how you end up applying glass on top of glass. It's quite a process. Well, I haven't gotten to watch glass blowing in a while. I always say it's fun to watch somebody like Dave. It makes it look so easy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, I suppose, you know, if you were well-trained and talented and then went 40 years, maybe, but I can't even imagine. Uh, so now they're applying threading and they're doing this in a random style on this piece, kind of in the way that Lutz glass would have been made around the 1890s. Yeah, yeah, you better be really confident in what you're doing. <laughs> Here's some of his finished product there, you see fish and critters and a bell and various fruits. This is interesting because it's got hanging hearts. He was known for that at Fenton. Mushrooms. And there it is, Williamstown, West Virginia. That's the location right where Fenton was made. So it's neat that glass blowing is still taking place here with a glass blower who worked for them. And you wear lots of gloves and you use lots of fire resistant material and that is how you're able to shape things. You can see the steam coming off of it or the smoke. 
Day now. He's got to get this next piece ready here. You notice all of that threading is now blended into the piece. It's not on the surface anymore. And then here is this little piece. He's going to dip for some additional color. And these will be more appendages for this bird with egg that is being created before our eyes. So at the very end, what he formed was one of these pieces. When it cools down, it'll be a bird on top of an egg. Here's an example with the various swirls. That's why he did all of those different lines of glass so that it would end up with a swirl effect when he was done. Pretty amazing that he's been doing this as a glass blower for, gosh, 40 years at least.